once we rode streetcars, played all day on an island, traveled in style, and saw movies in grand golden palaces. Oh, it's wonderful. If I'd have thought I'd never see it again, you know, I'd have paid more attention. Things change, the whole neighborhood has changed. And you can't stop progress. Progress is wonderful, but there are some things that maybe go by the wayside that maybe we should have kept. From Stumptown to Rip City, what has Portland lost in between? Do you know what used to be where Pioneer Square is now? Can you remember what we did on Hayden Island before there was a shopping center? This is a tale of things that aren't here anymore. These are the stories of the people who remember them. When I think of the atmosphere of the park, I think I think of the, um, the sounds. Right after the merry-go-round music started, the, um, the Funhouse Lady had a program sequence laugh that went on all day long. That's the way it was for 42 summers at the Jansen Beach Amusement Park. For me, it could have gone on forever. The Nora with me. These people remember because they worked there. I just was infatuated with it. Still am. I knew, I knew Ron when he was a little high school kid. Yeah. But one of the biggest thrills was the day Al knocked three guys off the platform in the Tilter World. <laughs> Because they were swearing, or what was it, Al? That was it. Yeah. They, they were swearing, and he didn't like people swearing in the park, and boom, they went flying. <laughs> I, I've mellowed. I've mellowed. No more of that. <laughs> Dixie Ross started as a teenager July 4th, 1955. After selling tickets and working at the funny photo booth, she discovered her true talent the Midway Games. She recalls her first day of work with her new boss. He showed me the ropes, so to speak, on how to work the crowd and, and uh, make odds and, and that type of thing. I encouraged the crowd to play our game, which was a milk can, throw the mush ball in the milk can, win the teddy bear or a poodle, bit, poodle dog. And uh, I really had a lot of fun with it. Long about noon, he said, well, I'm not going to worry now when I'm gone. And I said, what do you mean gone? He said, I'm catching a train out of here by 1 o'clock. And he said, I didn't want to leave the owner of the, of the concession uh, high and dry with nobody to run it. So from then on, I had my own, my own spot. The amusement park on Hayden Island was actually created as a promotional tool for the revolutionary knitted swimsuit. Uh, Jansen Knitting Mill started in 1910, and in their endeavors to promote swimming, uh, they put funds into a new company called Hayden Island Amusement Company, and they opened the amusement park in 1928, May 26, 1928. The prime interest was swimming, with an Olympic-sized pool, the only one in the Pacific Northwest, and then a major family pool and two small kiddie pools well, for the kiddies. There's a figure eye there too that you could see every time you crossed the bridge. The, the oh, dancing, oh, the big the diving, diving girl, girl yeah. the red diving girl, which was their, their logo. 
Uh, they had Olympic tryouts in, the, in, the, in that one big pool. And there was, there was considerable area around where you could uh, spread out a towel or whatever and sunbathe. Or, and there was concessions down there for, for yeah. some f ice cream items. And, yeah. uh, but uh, this was a big, big pool. Uh, it would handle 3,000 people. For most of this century, Jansen Beach was a monument to leisure. Few other businesses existed on the island in the Columbia. But one remains that was born during the heyday of the amusement park. That's where we used to go if we closed the park on Sunday night, everybody would go over to Waddles, have a few drinks and some uh, double ducks. Yeah, yeah. And that was the original uh, two patty hamburger. They called it the Waddle Double Duck. I was always embarrassed about being called a Waddle in school. The kids always laughed at me. So I, and I called myself Waddell for a long time until I finally just gave up because everybody knew anyway. <laughs> Then I went to the University of Oregon. <laughs> I've been a duck ever since. <laughs> Russ Waddle has spent his whole life on Hayden Island, working down under that can't miss it sign. Started out as a busboy, and I'm still a busboy. <laughs> his father, Gene Waddle, opened the Pietro Belusky Design Restaurant, complete with car hops, on September 1st, 1945. The date Japan surrendered was just icing on the cake, I guess. <laughs> Through the eyes of a teenager living next door to our own version of Coney Island, Russ Waddle witnessed Portland during the Second World War. The whole, the whole time uh, was exciting those days, with Jansen Beach across the way, and, and uh, just there was so much activity out here. Being the only restaurant on the island, everyone from Jansen Beach came to eat now at Waddle's. And young Waddle had his own brand of trade out with the park. I was in charge of washing the uh, uh, swimming suits, for, uh, the rental swimming suits that they uh, rented at the counter there uh, to go into the pool. And of course, I didn't get paid, I got to swim free. This is Dorothy Hinsbark, the first waitress we ever had in this place. So if we, if you, so if you have any complaints, it's, it goes to Dorothy. That reminds me. Once I was, uh, for I, I, I was wanting to impress this girl, so I took. I, I had five dollars. I don't know where the heck I got that five dollars, but I had it, and I was going to take her out and take her to Jansen Beach and show her a good time, really good time, because I really liked her. And I, and I got over there, and I got to this guess your weight place or something. I blew the whole five bucks in about five minutes, and she was so mad. <laughs> and I had to take her home, and that was it. <laughs> While Russ was learning the do's and don'ts of dating, the big bands were reaching the height of their popularity. To many Portlanders, Jansen's golden canopy ballroom was the heart of the park. So we, a huge number of national bands, Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, Jim, Wayne King, the Waltz King, Jimmy Dorsey, Harry James, uh, Anson Weeks, Spike Jones and the City Stickers. And, uh, like Spike Jones came in here one day and he had this huge red and white polka dot tie and a zoot suit. I don't know if you remember what zoot suit was, but it's kind of like that. You know Spike Jones, who was a real character. There was one more attraction we loved just as much as the ballroom and the pools. It was big, it was loud, and it went really fast. The first year that I turned nine, uh, one of my cousins uh, took me on it, and I went on it seven times in a row. <laughs> the Big Dipper described as a full half mile of devious track, included a 70-foot plunge, and was Jansen's most popular ride. A banner above the cars warned, hold your hat, hold everything. I mean, it just literally scared the pants off you. And when you got back on it, it did it right again. It was a wood, ride, a wood coaster, wood. Yeah. Uh, which meant somebody had to walk it at least once a day. And sometimes twice to make sure all the screws, nuts, and bolts were tight. Things began to look uncertain for Jansen in the post-war era. The Columbia River flooded the island. Portland's largest dance floor began to feel the pinch of big band music's decline. By 1957, 
there was no more dancing at Jansen. You had the competition from TV, and people just uh, didn't use the park to the degree that it had been. Then, on a spring day in 1960, fire consumed the old mill and the funhouse. I believe it was 1958, Nine. 59, 59, when uh, a young man stood up on the roller coaster and came out and uh, went underneath it and it killed him. And uh, that was opening night and we were just packed. And that ended everything. Worst day we ever had there. You have to remember, Jansen Beach uh, in its time would be like uh, your big, one of your big parks today, big theme park. There was, there was nothing like Jansen Beach. It was, it was the cream of the crop in those days. It, it only became old because the land became too valuable and they couldn't put money back into it uh, in relationship to what they get out of a shopping center. The Big Dipper made its final run on July 4th, 1970. It was raised the following day. Well, I'll always remember that. They hooked onto it with a cat, if I remember, and just started backing up, and the track, for some reason, didn't part. Remember that? And it just, and it just stretched that track out, and it just like, seemed like the coaster was trying to hold on as long as it could, and then, boom, then it went. It's just, yeah. it's just fond memories now. It's like pain. You never remember pain? I don't think we remember too much of the bad times, do we, Al? Don't remember the bad times. Just remember the all time. the good times. There were, there were good days. They were good days. I enjoyed every, well, almost every minute of it. Many of us have never completely exited the gates of Jansen Beach. Ron Burback owns and operates fantastic traveling shows. Les Buell and Al Taylor are on the board of directors of Oaks Park a place that, through its nonprofit status, will always be home to the Ferris wheel and the roller coaster. Dixie Ross married the operator of the octopus. At one time, her father was the operator of this 1921 C.W. Parker carousel, the most beautiful ride the park ever offered. It now lives at the Jansen Beach Shopping Center, the last reminder of the playground that was. by Mary Shell, the one nothing pitch. Jones hits a drive to right center field, a well hit ball. Going over is the right fielder Perry, makes the catch. When it came to professional sports, baseball was once the most popular game in town. Portland's Pacific Coast League Club was born in 1903, and Vaughn Street Ballpark was their field of dreams. <laughs> it was an old ballpark, but it had great tradition, oh. and the people loved it. So it was a beautiful yeah. ballpark. It was beautiful. Yeah, the charm of Fenway, Chicago, the yeah. Cubs, uh, that's what Vaughn Street was. The weather-beaten wood structure stood in the heart of what old-timers called Slab Town at 24th and Vaughn. The Esco Foundry stood beyond right field, belching orange smoke day and night. The home team was known as the Browns for the first two seasons, then renamed the Giants until 1906 when the Beaver moniker stuck. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Blackburn, former voice of the Portland Beavers, presenting the unofficial Vaughn Street Hall of Famers. The only player in the history of baseball to go straight from the Sandlots to the Major Leagues, Brooklyn Dodgers Hall of Famer and most popular beaver of the first half century, second baseman Eddie the Spider Basinski. Called the best shortstop in black baseball in the 40s, he led the Pacific Coast League in batting his rookie season and several other seasons. 
on the Beaver Roster in 1955 and 56, Artie Wilson. A neighborhood kid who worked his way up the Vaughn Street ranks from bat boy to warm-up pitcher, Vince Pesky Paveskovich. He was raised on the dike, son of renowned Vaughn Street groundskeeper Rocky Benevento, Dick Benevento. They were each part of an era when Portlanders waited anxiously through the rains of early spring for the season opener. We'd get into town the day before opening day. We'd actually parade through this city. It was very popular for kids to cut school and go to the opening day at the Vaughn Street Park. 12,000, some 340 was the capacity for Vaughn Street in the stands. And then opening day, then they put them on the field. And we loved that because you hit a line to right to right center, left center. They got into the crowd, you got a ground rule double. Loved it. <laughs> the Vaughn Street grounds were meticulously kept by Rocky Benevento. He was so popular in the city, many people say he could have run for mayor and won. Rocky ran the park like a community center for the families who lived in the mostly Slavic neighborhood. And everybody growing up in the Northwest Portland had something to do with Vaughn Street. Um, the parents, the sisters, the brothers, everybody was involved around the ballpark. We learned how to pick up bats, handle balls to the umpire between innings, and eventually we got good enough that we moved into being what they call a clubhouse boy. But we were hired for 75 cents a day, hired by his father to shag down balls, but that's not where it ended. We had to be there to sack peanuts. Fans who walked through Vaughn Street's gates were something more than spectators. There was real personal contact with the players. I mean, the same people sat in the same boxes, the same people were there all the time. And even when you'd warm up, you could go over and touch hands through the wire, you know, talk to them, or even talk to them while you were warming up. They were that close. Fan loyalty often attempted to fight Mother Nature. They used to sit out there, be raining, and have newspaper over their head, wait, see if we get a chance to play the game. They would sit there, sit there, and they said, heck, it's not raining that hard, and they'd call the game, you'd hear a big moan go, oh, no. Broadcasters Raleigh Truitt and Bob Blackburn provided play-by-play -play of Beaver games on KWJJ. The Beavers had the largest minor league radio network in the mid-1950s, with listeners across the state. For many years, away games were recreated in the studio, with canned crowd noise and homemade sound effects to mimic bat, ball, and mitt. Any Beaver booster will tell you that the Pacific Coast League's Anything Goes brand of baseball offered more excitement than the major leagues. Uh, and then you had the two-gun Gettle, that son. Yeah, he almost he's a pitcher. Me. He almost killed oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> this guy he's actually pitching. wore six guns on the mound. They let him do it, and he had blanks in the guns. And if some guy got a hit, he'd shoot at him, <laughs> running the first. Yeah, this is kind of stuff that happened. And was a good pitcher. Yeah, oh, he was. The Beavers brought eight league pennants to Vaughn Street, the last being in 1945. But the height of Pacific Coast play came in 1952, when the league won an open classification, placing it somewhere between AAA and the big leagues. Coast League could have been a third major league. You had built-in rivalries with Hollywood and Los Angeles, Oakland and San Francisco, Portland and Seattle was wild. It was, uh, the rivalry was so bad that uh, Bill Mulligan, uh, our owner, would give us 25 bucks for each player every time we'd beat Seattle. It was that bad. But this high caliber of baseball couldn't turn back the clock on Vaughn Street. The structure was in danger of being condemned by the fire marshal. When the ball game was over, people leaving, here goes the cigarette butt and would get down there mixed with the peanut shells and maybe the hot dog wrapper. And then someone saw fire. Yeah. I mean, you'd have all kinds of chaos and injured people. So dad would get up there and he said, excuse me, sir, no alarm. Would you please move over just a little bit? And with that, there'd be a nice little fire going. And he'd put out the fire and nobody would know the difference. On September 11th, 1955, the Beavers took to the Vaughn Street Diamond for the last time. Eddie Basinski hit the park's final home run. The crowd took a long time leaving that day. They just didn't want to leave. They couldn't believe they were never going to sit in those seats again. Listen into the 
stretch. Here's the 0-2 pitch. The runner on the In 1956, the team moved to Multnomah Stadium, known today as Civic Stadium. The team set a league attendance record that year, but what happened next changed the Pacific Coast League forever. A jubilation out west. San Francisco hailed the Giants. Los Angeles turned out to greet the Dodgers. After the National League Giants and Dodgers came west in 1958, the Coast League was downgraded to AAA. The Beavers played their last game in Portland on September 9, 1993. Today, a parking lot sits on the site of Old Vaughn Street. The only reminder of its past is a plaque dedicated to Rocky the Groundskeeper. The Portland Rockies take us out to the ball game at Civic Stadium, but these four treasures from the game's past still dream of a big league Portland. I always said, Poland Beavers could have a major league club here easy. If they had a place to build a stadium, you got the uh, peoples around. You can draw from first Hale, Washington, from Eugene, Hillsburg. It's better than Seattle. It's the best town on the coast. All you got to do is get some place where they can build a stadium here. They'll draw. Them. something about a hotel that's fascinating. No matter what, uh, what part of the hotel you work in, there's always excitement happening in the hotel. Some of the most beautiful buildings missing from our cityscape were hotels. So really a, a nice hotel that is now gone, and that was the Congress Hotel right across uh, the uh, street from the Public Service Building. I was married there. No, you, you were married in the Congress Hotel. Yes, yeah. married in the but the one everyone seems to miss most was the Queen Anne-style crown jewel of the city, the Portland Hotel. The Portland Hotel I miss greatly. It was a beautiful hotel, a beautiful building. My mom took me to a Christmas dinner at the Portland Hotel one time when my dad was out of town. I think the dinner cost $3. It was huge. <laughs> and, but it was wonderful. We really enjoyed ourselves. And that was a magnificent structure that sits now where Pioneer Square is. Completed in 1890, it was the center of the city. President Theodore Roosevelt once stayed there. As an itinerant actor in the 1920s, an unknown Clark Gable sang there. Some years later, Gert Boyle, owner of Columbia Sportswear, learned a thing or two about the business world there. I worked for an insurance company Grossman's Insurance Company, which was on the first floor, and I was a file clerk. And, I mean, the Portland Hotel was like, you know, the Taj Mahal of Portland. In the 1950s, a wave of renewal frenzy overtook us. Suburbanization was the future, and there was no place in the atomic age for an elderly dowager. The building's effects were auctioned off, like the Ladd and Tilton Bank, the Cook Building, and scores of other landmarks, the Wrecking Ball was the last visitor to the Portland Hotel. You couldn't operate the Portland Hotel profitably. It was an ancient structure. It didn't have uh, the appropriate wiring, uh, very expensive to maintain. The property was a whale of a lot more valuable than the hotel, which I'm assuming must have been losing money in its late years. Still, the destruction of Portland's downtown palace for a parking lot rendered many of us disillusioned with the demolition derby. Now, but isn't it lucky that nobody felt that way about some of the great art that's in, in Europe and some of the 
wonderful gargoyles that are on the cathedrals, in, let's say like in Paris. They didn't say, oh, well, you know, it's cheaper to knock it down. You never know what you have until you miss it. There is another hotel we've missed that's about to give us a second chance. After languishing in semi-consciousness for over 30 years as a federal office building, the Multnomah Hotel is being reborn. Well, the great grandsons of the people that put in the ceilings are redoing the ceilings here. The renovation by Embassy Suites is bringing back a lot of memories of this grand hotel. It felt like you were just in some place exotic. Uh, it was awesome. It was this huge lobby with chandeliers and beautiful furniture and people mingling constantly. Jim Gimarelli knows he was a bellman here. And I was fortunate to get into the hospitality industry in 1950, and it's one of the most exciting things I ever did in my life. For Jim, life at the largest hotel in the city was a series of elegant dinners, endless dancing, and a constant stream of new people. At that time, most of the travel was done by trains and the Shasta Daylight, which came from San Francisco, would get into Portland at 11.25 when it was on time. And people would be lined from the front desk a half a block outside around to the 4th Avenue entrance of the hotel trying to get into the hotel that evening. A banquet for Charles Lindbergh was held there after he landed the Spirit of St. Louis at the Swan Island Airport in 1927. But there were banquets every night, and they had banquets galore there. I mean, one of the rooms, the grand ballroom, was a city block long, and on each level they had different kitchens, and of course the main restaurant was the Café Baron right in the lobby. And of course I have a menu dating way back to 1953, a dinner. Uh, a grilled salmon steak was a dollar fifteen cents. A tenderloin steak was $3.50. Uh, a regular room ran you about $4 yeah, a night with just a straight shower. And of course, I still have one of the room keys. There was always celebrities coming into Portland that stayed at the Multnomah. And this was exciting to see. I'll put Elvis Presley on the top of the list, um, Joan Crawford, um, oh, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, oh, I can go on and on with these people. Jimmy Stewart was there for, oh, a couple, three months when they did the filming of Bend in the River. We all dressed up in Western attire. But my greatest thrill, other than Elvis, probably number one, was the first time I waited on the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and that was a thrill. Because, you know, in those days, it isn't like today. Uh, you went right into the suite with them, you sit down, talk to them, and, um, yeah, not that many Secret Service people around, you know, and it was just like uh, seeing an old friend. The American Renaissance-style hotel was home away from home to celebrities and regular folks alike. It fed and housed them royally, and did not forget about the entertainment. I remember the pillars, do you? June Matlock and Jane Gish remember the Multnomah for its dance floors. Roomy areas that were just right for the moves of a ballet, or the click of tap shoes. In those days, they were known as the Parker Twins. Our starring dance was uh, done to the music of Smoke It's In Your Eyes at a very adagio tempo. And the second one that we would do for our particular act was a pretty good tap dance. And we, uh, we made our own wardrobe for our, our, for our act. 
The Parker twins moved to Portland from Los Angeles in the 1930s. They began dancing at the Multnomah Hotel, the Rivoli Theater, Jack and Jill's, and even the Portland Hotel. Well, we worked in a line of girls a lot, too, where there's 12 girls, 16 girls, and it's put, up, put on by a producer, somebody who teaches you all the routines. Every week, a change of the show. I liked it all. Yeah, and I, I liked it all, too. I loved it all. Yeah. They married local musicians, sang in the Trinity Episcopal Choir, and spent their evenings performing on most of the stages of Portland. Did you remember the name of Jackie Coogan, who was Charlie Chaplin's little boy? He was a big man, and he was a, a band director. He came and sat at the supper club this one night. His band was playing in town, and we got to meet him after the show. This, uh, this, is, this is the real, you know, this is what you hear, read about. Uh, after the show, a, a waiter brought a note back, and it's from Jackie Coogan, and he said, he would like to take out those Parker twins. And we went with him because it was so exciting. And he was with an entourage, and we went out after the show. We went to Jolly Jones to eat. Oh. Have you heard of Jolly Jones? <laughs> okay, that was open all night. But that and that's where the people who worked in show business would spend a lot of time. So we went in there to eat. This is about <laughs> four in the morning. In 1960, the Multnomah looked as though it might suffer the same fate as the Portland. Its location near Old Town fell out of favor, and it faced stiff competition from newer hotels. Jim saw the writing on the wall and headed for the Benson. The Parker twins had already moved on to Pendleton to open their own school of dance. The hotel closed and harbored only the ghost of gayer times. Until now. It's so exciting, I can't believe I'm back, like home again. To think that I had the privilege of being part of this hotel years ago, it really makes me feel good. Chinatown, Old Town. Hello, boys. You used to hear that a lot in Portland. For over half a century, streetcars rattled through every neighborhood, carrying us anywhere we wanted to go. I definitely missed the trolley cars that went up and down all over the city, and they were great. The streetcar used to be wonderful. It was these little sort of boxes that would wiggle back and forth. When I worked in, uh, in the 40s, people could buy three tokens for a quarter. Al Nelson was enchanted with the swaying cars and clanging bells of the streetcars. After a stint in the Army Air Corps of World War II, he joined the ranks of Portland's motormen. I, I just came back from the South Pacific and I was kind of restless. I always wanted to run a streetcar, so I went and got a job. Good morning. In 1946, Al Nelson was a motorman yeah, out of the uh -huh. Piedmont district. Today, he's a conductor on the Vintage Trolley, a privately funded trolley that goes from Lloyd Center to downtown. Red Lion Lloyd Center. The Oregon Electric Railway Historical Society operates the Willamette Shore Trolley. This is the Blackpool car, built in 1902 in Blackpool, England. Broadway car was built in 1932 in Philadelphia. They run four times a day on this old Southern Pacific Railroad line. But in the 20s, these tracks saw 64 trains a day race back and forth between Portland and Lake Oswego. These two lines are all that remain of a metropolis-wide rail system. But Al helps us remember what it was like to ride in his day. He knows the history of the pieces that are left of Old Portland, like the New Market Theater. It started its life as an opera house. It is a good example of the cast-iron architecture that remains in Portland. In the cast-iron district, 
Buildings used iron for structural integrity and fantastic ornamentation. By the turn of the century, nearly 200 cast iron creations graced our waterfront. They were virtually all demolished by the 1950s, partly to build Harbor Drive. That's gone now too. But when the romance of iron columns and scrolls reigned, our earliest form of public transportation drove by it. In 1872, the first public rail car, pulled by a horse, clip-clopped its way up and down First Street. By 1890, electric cars were taking us from downtown to Albina. It's hard to tell now, but cable cars climbed impressive trestles up to Portland Heights. It seems so modern, these iron rails covering the city, this mass transit. Where did it go? Rails took us everywhere, and everyone rode them. There were no, uh, you know, orange buses to take, uh, take me to school. I had, had to depend on, uh, on public transportation, and that was the, uh, the uh, Mama Villa streetcar that took me to Washington High School. Like many other children of the time, Sam Nato loved the feel of the old trolleys picking up speed as they went downhill. As you know, kids are kids. Uh, we used to try to sway the streetcar as much as possible and the conductor would get very mad. You'd come back and yell at the kids and stop doing that. Because you know, as, as you swayed there, you know, it made it more difficult for him to run the streetcar, I guess. <laughs> His father owned an import store, and the family lived in Mount Tabor. This is the house that I grew up in. When I moved here when I was uh, four and a half years old, the rock gar garden was put in by my father, and, and these two walnut trees, I believe, uh, were planted by my father, and they've grown very big. So he just loved to garden. When I came to school, which nobody seemed to know, or know, is I could not speak English. And so I learned English in the first grade of grammar school. Then, then from there I went to Washington High School, and that was the experience of riding the, the great trolley. In the days before Nintendo and designer tennis shoes, we knew simpler childhood joys. Oh wonderful experiences like uh, bicycling up to Mount Tabor uh, and uh, it was great. While Sam Nato was racing down Mount Tabor on his bike, events were unfolding that would change him and the rest of us forever. The automobile was winning the hearts of Americans everywhere, becoming the modern way to get from here to there in Portland. Then our involvement in World War II saw Portland's population explode as people from all over the country came to work in our shipyards. Portland's landscape changed dramatically and would change again beyond anyone's imagination one Sunday in 1948 as Al Nelson finished his shift. Yeah, I was standing at the window uh, checking in with the clerk. The dispatcher called over on the Intercom, do you have any operators there? The clerk mentioned, I have one checking in here. And he said, tell him to, that we need him bad to take a 900 bus and head for Vanport. It's going out. Vanport, one of the nation's largest war effort communities, housed the huge influx of shipyard workers and their families. Situated on Delta Park, it would not survive the surge of the Columbia on Memorial Day of 1948. When I arrived there, there was a bus sitting ahead of me, and the operator was standing outside, very disturbed. The water was coming up fast, and he said, well, I said, let's get out of here. He, he said, well, I don't know if I can get the bus through. I said, let's go. We don't have time, and my bus is higher, and if you get stuck, I'll push you out of here. 
we finally got up on the dike and watched that whole thing take place. And the apartments, big apartment buildings were just coming off their foundations and floating around. And the water was actually swirling in there from the amount coming in. And they were cracking together just like matchboxes. It was really something, I'll never forget it. By that time, buses had already infiltrated the routes of the streetcars. Pulled down by the undertow of progress, electric railway companies disappeared, tracks were paved over, and trolleys burned. I think it was a mistake. No people think progress the same way, I guess. Now we can only ride this trolley and wonder what was here before. Next station. It's getting more fun. We have one of the finest streetcar systems in the, in, in the country. And of course that's gone now. But they're coming back. The automobiles drove them away, but the automobiles are causing them to come back. If you look at Max, some of its tracks are in the same locations as old streetcar lines. And the trolleys seem to be pushing their way back into the city, one route at a time. Perhaps we're ready to go rattling through our streets again. Before rock and roll, another scene was emerging alongside the big bands and ballrooms. Portlanders flocked to the jazz clubs to see the best entertainers in the West. When you're smiling, when you're smiling. Mary Lockridge, the million dollar grandma, and Larry Adair are two icons from the golden era of jazz in Portland, a time when the never ending sounds of hot music lingered in the streets. When I was six years old, and um, in vaudeville, you know, those days you had uh, a movie, and then there was the newsreel, and then there would be the vaudeville show, and that's where I came in. I've been playing about 45 years, I guess. I started when I was 15. I wanted to start a lot sooner, but my folks wouldn't let me, you know. I had loved it since I was four or five. Jazz has always had a following, not as wide a following now, possibly, as in the 30s and 40s, because, oh, 20s and 30s, it was the popular music. During World War II, we had many shipyards here, the Kaiser shipyards. There was a great influx of people here. They ran 24-hour shifts, and during times of stress, people like to have fun. They need to forget about the stress of war. So often, this opened up many venues for music in general and a lot of jazz. And uh, a shift would get off, say, midnight at the shipyards, and uh, they'd have a band waiting in the rec room to play for them. Joe Wimmer got his start playing the clarinet at the hot spots in town after World War II. 1949, I was 15 and a half, my first professional job. The popularity of jazz grew from the Kaiser shipyards to a network of clubs lining the streets of downtown Portland and up and down Northeast Williams Avenue. There really wasn't a, a Friday, Saturday night type thing. I mean, this went on all week long, seven days a week. Downtown Portland was just buzzing with clubs. Um, up and down Broadway, on Madison, and there were just clubs everywhere. There was a Portland club and the Clover Club, which was in the Taylor Building. 
For a taste of the tropics, there was the Bally High on Southwest 10th and Stark. It always set just the right mood for Pat O'Neill's quartet to back stars like the Mills Brothers, Nancy Wilson, Dinah Washington, and Dorothy Dandridge. Performances were sold out every night at the Bally High. It was the best stage in town. And then there was a Cherokee Club, which was the basement of the old Oregon Hotel. And that's where all the musicians met after work and had jam sessions. I worked in the Cotton Club, which was over on the east side. But the original Cotton Club was in the uh, Golden West Hotel. That was there when I was a little kid. And uh, a lot of the big orchestras came in there. And my mother used to let me stay up on Saturday night to listen to them on the radio. And bands like Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway and Count Basie, they came down there to play. I was working up the street from Della Reese when she came here. And I think the cover charge was a dollar or something like that, you know. So it wasn't a big price you had to pay, you know. You came in to, to enjoy. Among the big name stars to come to town was Louis Armstrong and the All-Stars. Portland was their last stop on the 1954 world-renowned tour that took them to Russia. And Louis and his all-stars were appearing at the Paramount, uh, known as the Snitzer, uh, now, appearing uh, at the Paramount Theater that evening. And, uh, I guess Louis and Monty had tried to arrange that we'd get together, the Castle Jazz Band and his all-stars. The original Castle Jazz Band came together in Portland in 1943 and entertained us for the next half century. Leader and banjo player Monty Ballou met Louis Armstrong through their mutual love of jazz, and they became lifelong friends. The pair couldn't resist having just one jam session together at the 419 Club before the big gig at the Paramount. Comes intermission at the 419 Club. With our instruments in hand, we run down the stairway, hop in a cab that Monty had arranged, zip up Broadway, hop out, sneak in the side door, come up to the lobby, come down the aisles, now the Saints go marching in. Saints People just went wild, as you can imagine. Marching and the next morning, he left with his band to be the first band, Saints American band, to appear behind the Iron Curtain, as it was called then. And from that time, he received a, one of his many nicknames, the Ambassador of Jazz. Eventually, the wheel turned on the jazz clubs, and their numbers dwindled from our streets. One of the things that shot down the music business and many others was the advent of TV. People stayed home. As the rock and roll scene came in, uh, and a different generation. And then this generation wanted something different than their parents had had. Look up. Look up. Mary Lockridge and Larry Adair's union some 32 years ago sparked an unmatchable duo that can still be heard at Kelly's Olympian downtown. So hush, little baby, don't you cry. Though many of the clubs themselves have faded into the history of the Rose City, the lifeblood of jazz still flows here. typical day in Portland was you had to dress up. You had to wear white gloves, and uh, if you met anyone for lunch, you met under the clock at Meyer and Frank. I mean, that, that was the only place to meet. Well, with fewer shopping malls, I think that it was a, an event to come downtown. People came downtown and shopped and had lunch, maybe went to a movie, and it was a more special thing. Well, Ungar's was next door to Berg's, as I recall, and the thing I remember about Ungar's was that um, there was a fountain of perfume 
oh, in the right. entrance. Yes. Well, do you remember Olds and Keen? Very oh, much yes. so, and they had a very good high board also. Starting in the 1950s, being named to the high boards, or high school fashion boards, was an honor some compared to that of Rose Princess. Department stores like Olds, Wartman and King, Meyer and Frank, and Lipman Wolf chose one girl from each high school to be their fashion representative, their it girl for a year. Charles F. Berg was a smaller specialty women's store, unique in its time in that it catered to very young women. It's not here anymore, but it's a place these women will never forget. They were on the Berg's high board in the 1960s. I got a special delivery letter in the mail that came in their nice pink stationery with the red special delivery let, um, sticker on it and told me that I had been selected. Here's your pink letter. That's my original pink letter from when yes, I Yes, but they're wonderful. Everything was pink Indian. at Berg's, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is wonderful. Sunday, April 14th, 1968. I was trying to Bergs it looks introduces like Levi's for gals. Though the Berg business and the high boards disappeared in the late 70s, Portland's most stunning example of Art Deco architecture remains. The peacocks, flowers, and sunbursts still glitter on Southwest Broadway. And they had these beautiful elevators. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was, and they were always run by an elevator and a band operator. operator. With right. one of the doors that slid right. across. Yes. Yes. We had outfits that we wore. They gave us outfits to wear. Remember our Berg's yes. blouses with our names on them? Chumley. Chumley. Blouses. That's right. Chumley blouses. <laughs> Being a high board girl also meant doing fashion shows. We had a, a big one at the Hoyt Hotel in the Roaring Twenties room. And I remember for all of us girls to get up at five o'clock in the morning with orange juice cans in our hair and, and be, putting the makeup on and knowing all our friends were gonna be in the audience. And it was a real exciting time. Some of the shows were here at the Benson Hotel. Some were at what was then the Paramount Theater, now the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall. Meet one of the former master of ceremonies. They would have, on Saturday mornings at the Paramount or at the stores, fashion shows. We would play them and I emceed them. Lynn Easton wasn't just any MC, An alumni of David Douglas, he was the drummer for a band we all remember, the Kingsmen. They started out as five high school buddies playing high school dances, banquets, and supermarket openings and enjoying Portland of the 1960s. My high, sc high school memories are, are just absolutely the fondest. I had a great time. Probably one of the most popular things during the high school years, of course, were the drive-in restaurants, and there were a number of them around, and it was mandatory that you cruised some of those. Probably the most uh, popular was Yaws in the Hollywood area. Everyone needed to cruise through there at least three times, and you always met with Bob the Cop, uh, Tootsie Roll Bob, who had uh, individual Tootsie Rolls that if you were being cool, he'd throw them in the car. Yaws started as a little tiny operation in the Hollywood district and became popular for their hamburgers. We grind our own, W-G-O-O. -O. There was the speck over on Powell. The speck, yes. <laughs> Mashed potatoes and gravy, right? <laughs> there were great places to get your nose broken. You could go down to the TikTok, which was a biker restaurant. Uh, you cruised that one real quick. With the advent of drive-in restaurants and movie theaters, the band, like almost everyone else in America, got their own wheels. Uh, at that time, I then had a 57 Chevy convertible. Probably about 150,000 miles and smoked like crazy, but it sure looked good. But when the band was together and we were the house band at the Chase out in Milwaukee, the band would always get there early so that we could back in all of our old convertibles out front. Now the Chase was a big place, right, in Milwaukee. I do remember that. The Headless Horseman, which was downtown Portland, which is now the Brasserie Montmartre. Division Street Chorale, once a country western dance hall, began to book all the top local rock and roll acts. It's a fun place to play, and always packed. 
When anything was going on at D Street, uh, nobody else had a dance in town because that's where everybody would be. And then came the song that would change everything. We were working as the house band at the Chase at that time, and the uh, owner, Ken Chase, who was then, as I mentioned, a DJ on KISN, came to the session and recommended that one of the most popular songs that we played was Louie Louie. Recorded for $38 in a studio around the corner from Jake's famous crawfish, it sold millions of copies and sent five boys from Stumptown on the road. It was pretty exciting to have somebody from Portland have a song that was, I don't know whether that was number one, or what, to hear it on the radio a lot. They'd give us a check once in a while, and we'd go, wow, isn't this great? It's never going down. But then the song got banned in Indiana. The group was tailed by the FBI. And it finally went to court, and there was a judge who said he'd listen to it at every speed and everything else, and his final definitive ruling were that it didn't matter at what speed you couldn't understand the words to the song, and so it really didn't much matter. The fact is, when Jack sang that song, he had braces on his teeth, he had had them tightened before, his mouth was very sore, and the mic was up about a foot, so he had to stand up and strain, and he wasn't the greatest singer going in. So, uh, who knows, who knows? It was an absolute, pure fluke. Some planet, someplace lined up for that five minute period of time when that record was cut. Pure fortune, pure luck. And that's all it was. But now, it seems like it was magic. An upbeat part of our collective history here in the city. The studio near Jake's is now the Atheist Community Center. Olds Wartman and King turned into the Galleria. Lipman Wolf is now Fifth Avenue Suites. And the drive-in restaurants have been taken over by even faster food. Even the chase is gone, and the Division Street Corral is silent. And everybody asks still today, I only have one question, what are the words to Louie Louie? And my answer is, I don't know, I was the drummer. Uh, I used to go down uh, run errands for my father on Saturday morning. Everybody worked Saturday half a day, and then we'd go out and have lunch, and he'd give me uh, 15 cents, and I'd go to the matinee at the uh, Paramount. I remember seeing uh, Buddy Rogers and Richard Arlen in Wings, which was one of the early talkies in uh, the real tear jerker, you know. Movies were cheap, very inexpensive. 10 cents is typical during the day. People were different. You know, um, I don't, I don't know why, but people were more, more trust, trusting. You trusted each other a lot more. I know that we never locked our doors in those, in those days. Well, it was pure safe on the streets in those days. Oh, golly, See, yes. we worked yeah. at night and we were out on the streets. Didn't, and didn't give it a gosh, thought. It was just like being daytime. Didn't give it a thought. Really. It leads us to ask, were things better before? That's a loaded question. <laughs> General DeWitt made, uh, made a declaration or a, a, uh, saying that uh, all Japanese uh, ancestry, anyone with as much as one quarter Japanese would have to evacuate uh, the West Coast. And so my uh, family, my family just left, and of course my father's business was destroyed. The city uh, council took away his uh, license to do business, and so uh, he closed up the store and left. We left. We we lost all that. The Natos eventually returned to Portland and to better times. Life goes on in the Rose City. 
but without some of what made us who we are. When I came back from Arizona, and I went to school there first, and couldn't wait to have a Yoss hamburger, but you know it wasn't as good anymore as I'd remembered, because you can't really ever go back, you know? You have your memories, but things are never the same. We move about the city, and the past taps us on the shoulder and whispers in our ear. Sometimes we turn around, and there's the Multnomah Hotel, or a trolley, or the Central Library. In the center of the city of bridges and roses and buying and selling, is the real city. Stores and malls and convention centers and banks and warehouses fall away. The towers of commerce crumble into light. Water under the bridges, winter roses. Through stone shines the open city of imagination outlasting all convention, where nothing is bought or sold, is given away, inaniably ours, inheritance of light. Thank you.